our session on willpower, which we thought was kind of festive, um, or not, as the case may be. So what we're going to look at today is what's neuroscience, and science in general, because quite a lot of this is about behavioral economics as well, telling us about how to have greater self-control or greater willpower. Um, so you all know who we are. We're Head, Heart, Brain. We work in the area of leadership development and looking at business processes from the viewpoint of what neuroscience telling us about the way the brain works and the best way to get people effective in a work environment. So willpower. So we can think about willpower as really being about managing competing goals. So how willpower tends to feel to us is as if I've got something, an impulse or a habit that I want to um, satisfy right now. And that compares with something I want to achieve in the future. So, you know, the classic one is, of course, about food. So I want to lose some weight, and my impulse is to eat that biscuit, or in my case, cheese. Um, but my competing goal is I know that if I do that, I'm going to put weight on, or at least I'm not going to lose the weight that I want to, um, I want to lose. And, um, you know, that's a conflict. So it feels almost like we've got the devil on one shoulder saying, go on, just do that now. It will feel nice. It will feel great. Um, and the angel on the other shoulder saying, hold on a minute, um, you've got this more important goal, that you really, so you really want to resist what's going on here. Um, and there are lots of theories about willpower. What we know from a brain perspective is that thing that inhibits us taking the impulse is a part of our brain called the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and a lot of the work here has been done with our old friend, Matt Lieberman, and he calls it the brain's braking system. It's in the front part of your brain on the right. Um, and basically what this part of the brain does is it inhibits those impulses. So that impulse to eat the biscuit, to shout at someone, um, to to um, you know, do all the things that are socially unacceptable, basically, but are also um, the things that are competing against your long-term goals. So this part of the brain kind of holds you back from taking that impulsive action, and it could be, from a survival point of view, thought of as the opposite to our fight-flight um, freeze response. So it's the part of the brain that helps us to, to take a longer term view and um, to actually, you know, for example, overcome uh, the instinct to, you know, walk away from somebody who we might think is our enemy or, and to overcome um, some of that fight flight response. So the braking system is what's really important to us. And we know that that braking system is very vulnerable to things like lack of sleep, stress, being overly busy, and um, uh, alcohol. So those are, you know, right off some of the things that you can kind of avoid doing because they empower that braking system. So if we look at the trends in research, there's been quite a lot of different views about what is it that helps us have willpower. And here are some of the kind of leaders in the thinking. So probably the one that we, um, have, most of us will have heard about is Walter Michel's work on the marshmallow um, experiments, which he uh, wanted to find out what was it that helped people to um, hold back on doing something that they wanted to do right now and to have willpower. 
so Liz, can we just pop to that um, video? So we've got a short video here. We won't play all of it. Um, you won't need to hear what's happening. Basically, this is a video of the experiments that Michel, uh, Walter Michel did back in the 60s. So he had young children come into the room, and they were offered either a marshmallow now or if they waited 15 minutes, which for a child of about four is actually an enormous amount of time, they, would, they were told they would get two marshmallows and just spend a couple of minutes looking at these children and um, their challenge in order to do this, in order to wait. I love these two. They're my particular favorite. <laughs> now, don't we all feel like that when that glass of wine <laughs> or the cookie or the biscuit or the mince pie are sitting in front of us? OK, so I think you get the picture. Let's see if we can pop that back. Um, so one of the things that came out of um, Walter Michel's research was that those children had tactics. Um, and he went on to look at some of those tactics. And they became some of the advice around willpower. So for example, distracting yourself from the urge that you have became one of the things that we know can help us achieve more willpower. And Walter Michel's um, work, he, he began to notice that um, the peers of his children who'd um, had the willpower not to eat that marshmallow were also doing better at school. So he, he did a follow-up study when those children were much older and found that um, the children who'd been able to resist the mar marshmallow were also doing better at school and later in life did better in relationships in work um, and in earning potential. And that led to um, a view that willpower is really one of the things that's a predictor of social success or business success. Um, and some say more so than things like uh, intelligence. And his research has been followed up by a longitudinal research in New Zealand of around 1,000 people who got very similar results, that those people who had greater willpower were also more successful. Um, and bringing that into the world of work, Evie and Gordon has recently um, produced some research that seems to show that people with greater self-control or greater willpower are also more successful in a work environment. I guess for a long time, the prevailing view on willpower was that it was something that we kind of um, um, we had, but it could wear down. So the more you actually used it, the harder it got to use again. And this was particularly attributed to the amount of glucose we had going into our brain. Um, so if we, for example, had to take a number of difficult decisions, the next decision would be more, um, we would be more likely to take a poor decision. So if we um, exerted some willpower not to eat uh, a mince pie, for example, and then a glass of wine was offered, we'd be much more likely to succumb to that glass of wine, even if it didn't meet our long-term goals. That research is being questioned now. And one of the people who's questioning it is Elliot Berkman, who believes that willpower is much more about our motivation. So our motivation to resist that temptation. Um, and he is beginning to produce research that says what happens is our motivation changes over a period of time. And it's those changes that mean we might actually um, kind of succumb to um, 
a challenge, a willpower challenge, when in the past we would have been able to resist it. So his research is kind of saying um, who we are and how we view our goals, if you like, our our things we want to achieve in the long term shift over time and it's understanding those shifts that's important. And then finally we've got Kelly McGonigal who really says, okay, there's lots of research but rather than look at the root causes of what stops us having willpower, what are the tactics that are going to help us achieve our goals? Um, and it's those sorts of tactics that we're going to have a look at this morning because I thought those would be the sorts of things that would probably help you the most. So to sum up, willpower is important because it seems to be linked with greater success in life and greater success in business. Um, and I think from some of the kind of responses we had as to why people want to improve their willpower over the holidays, we can see some of those motivations coming through. So they ranged from, you know, staying off social media, through getting on with your in-laws, um, through not eating mince pies, through to being able to um, actually do a black run. Uh, quite why you'd want to do that is another matter, but I guess for keen skiers, that's, um, that's important. So the first thing to understand about willpower is it is kind of like a muscle and the research has shown that there are things that help this part of our brain and things that hinder it. So if we've had a good night's sleep, uh, sorry, someone's asking here what's the title of El Elliot Berkman's book. It's not a book, it's actually an academic paper. Um, and Lindsay, I can't remember if that was on my list, but we'd drop you the link to that if, um, if you want it. Um, so we know that if we've had good sleep, which for most of us is more than six hours, if we meditate, if we exercise, and if we eat a particular type of diet, our ability to resist temptation and to deal with willpower challenges is greater. So what's happening is that um, breaking system in the brain is much stronger when those things are happening. So, for example, there's research that if we're well rested, we're much more likely to, um, to be able to uh, remember for a start off what our long-term goals are. <clears throat> there's also a direct correlation between the number of minutes you meditate and the strength of being able to resist temptation or to, be, to say no to something that is contrary to our long-term goals. And both meditation and exercise increase the number of links in the brain between the um, mammalian brain or the limbic brain and that prefrontal cortex area, the breaking system of the brain. So again, giving us more um, ability to say no to things. Excuse me. <coughs> and then on diet, what's been showed is having a high glycemic diet, um, and particularly a plant-based diet, so being vegan, is also um, strengthens your, your willpower because my son is vegan. I'm hoping that I'll do something for his studying, uh, which has always been a challenge for him. So one of the things that won't have escaped your notice on that list is, of course, they all require willpower to do all those things, to go to bed early, to have a meditation practice, to have an exercise practice and to eat things that are basically quite good for you. But what's worth knowing is they're self-reinforcing. Um, so if we have good sleep, we're more likely to exercise and to eat the right diet. Um, if we meditate, we're more likely to be able to resist, not just um, to getting to exercise, for example, but also other 
to achieve other long-term goals. So Philip's asking, what was the first area of the brain you mentioned just then, please? So uh, I think you're talking about the brain's braking system, which is the right lateral Ventr the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a bit of a mouthful. If you look at the link here that Lindsay's put up on Lieberman, that's a very accessible article um, about that part of the brain. So the links I was talking about is our impulses run from out of our um, limbic brain, so basically out of an older part of the brain, which includes areas like the amygdala. Um, so that's the area that, and our habit system, so the basal ganglia. So that's the area that's probably telling you to eat that biscuit now or to um, go and open your email when you're trying to do a report. So that's your impulsive area and your habit area. And the frontal cortex part of the brain is the brain that holds this braking system, the thing that inhibits us doing that, that makes us um, remember our long-term goals and also um, kind of hold back that impulse so that we can fulfill those longer term goals. OK, so this is um, our first uh, poll. So look at these pictures um, and think about how, which one of them, one, two, or three, most closely represents how you think about yourself now, so your current self and your future self. So, is it one, where those two things are completely separate? Is it two, where there is some overlap between how you think about yourself and how you think about yourself, say, in 10 to 20 years? Or is it three, where there's a great deal of overlap between how you think about yourself now and how you think about yourself? And just vote, is it one, two, or three? I recognize there may be people who are in between those, but just give us a sense of where you are. OK. Hmm, it's quite interesting. We've got almost a normal distribution there. A few less people who see no overlap between themselves now and their future self. Um, and a lot of the people are in that midpoint where, you know, it's kind of half and half. So the reason for getting you to do that is there's a lot of research that says the way we think about ourselves now, thanks Liz, that can go, and the way we think about ourselves in the future determines how successful we are at keeping those longer term goals. So at being able to resist willpower challenges. Um, and the more overlap there is, the easier we will tend to be able to keep those long-term goals. And that's because we know our future self. So we know from behavioral economics that things that are at a distance and things that are conceptual are harder to keep in mind. So if we don't really, so if we think about ourselves as someone different and that different person is a long time in the future, then it's much harder for us to be able to take action that's going to be good for that future self. And this research holds up for things like long-term goals. It holds up for things like saving for your pension. Um, it even holds up for things like honesty. So people who tend not to have much overlap between how they think about themselves now and how they think about themselves in the future are more likely to be able to rationalize to themselves why they did something dishonest now that has an impact in the future. So if you voted for that, it doesn't mean to say you have to be <laughs> dishonest. It just means you're going to have um, a harder challenge about meeting those long-term goals. So one of the experiments that people did here is they brought people into the lab and they created an avatar of their future self. And they got people to actually interview that future self about 
what it was like to be them in the future. So what it was like to be them, for example, at retirement. Um, and what they found was that the people who got to know their future self made much, um, were much more likely to make decisions about their future that were good for the future. So to save, for example, for um, their retirement and to um, take actions that were going to help them in the future rather than in the present. So this um, second technique is about really getting to know your future self. And one way um, that's been found to be effective to do that is to take a challenge you've got at the moment and write a letter to yourself about from the future about how you imagine you actually solved those issues. Um, and what were the things that you did? And almost thank yourself for uh, the actions that you, you took around that challenge. So um, that's one kind of technique that you can do if you think part of your willpower challenge is not really being connected with who you are in the future. There's um, also a short animated video on our website which uh, takes you through this research. And actually, this little picture is a summary of that, of that video. Uh, and you'll see Lindsay's also put up a quite an interesting TED talk from a guy called Daniel uh, Goldstein, um, who talks about how little, actually, we change over time. And so this getting to know your future self may not be quite as difficult as we think it could be. Uh, oops, sorry, Liz. Could we have our next poll up? OK, so our next poll asks, when you have a willpower failing, when you do something that doesn't meet your longer term goals, what is it you think about yourself? Do you say to yourself, oh, God, I'm just hopeless. I can never achieve what I want to. Or do you say, oh, well, we all mess up sometimes. This is not everything I am or who I am. OK, so most people seem to say, oh, well, I mess up sometimes, which is great, because that's the right answer. Um, or at least that's the better answer for managing your willpower. So what we, the researchers found that if we're self-compassionate, if we give ourselves a break, we're much more likely to um, stick with a willpower challenge the next time it comes along. Um, so if we say things like, don't worry, um, you know, I'll do better next time, uh, this isn't who I, everything I am, uh, I can actually, um, you know, point to times when I have resisted those challenges, the sorts of things you'd probably say to a friend if they slipped up on one of their challenges, all of those things help us to um, actually, the next time a willpower challenge comes along, to, uh, to be able to resist. So the message here is be compassionate with yourself. Um, and be nice to yourself. And the way to do that is to notice how you're feeling when you, um, when you fail your challenge. To say something nice to yourself like, you know, this isn't who I am. There are other good examples of me as a good person. I know I can do better in the future. And to give yourself some positive encouragement. So our next poll, Liz. Hello. Oh, here we go. So um, this is probably counterintuitive. So tell me which you think is more helpful, to visualize your success or to visualize you failing at a willpower challenge? OK, so most people are saying to visualize success. A few people to saying visualize 
exhaling. Thank you, Liz. So actually, counterintuitively, the answer is we tend to do better when we get to know how we might fail. It seems that, and I think this is related to Elliot Berkman's work, it seems that when we think about how successful you know, we've been, so we just think, oh, that's great, I resisted that mince pie, or I didn't scare myself going down the black run, the next time a challenge comes along, we kind of are self-satisfied and we're more likely to give up on the next challenge. Whereas what the research has found is that people who really got to understand what it is that makes them fail, what trips them up, um, were much more successful. So what they got people to do was actually keep a journal to really deepen their understanding of what are all the things they say to themselves when they're about to make an excuse not to, um, not to continue with a long-term goal or when they take the impulse to do something that they know is um, contrary to that long-term goal. And there's been a lot of research done around what are called if-then intentions. So if we write ourselves a note that say, says, if this happens, then I will take this action, we're again much more likely to stick with our goals. So you know, if I am offered a second mince pie, then I will ask for a piece of fruit, means that you're much more likely to stick with that if you've pre-planned it. Um, and lots and lots of uh, research around this, that this is one of the most powerful techniques you can adopt. So plan ahead of time how you're going to resist those temptations that come along. Um, the research also shows that both people and companies who um, are surprised by their lack of ability to meet a long-term goal uh, tend to go on to um, have more failures around meeting those goals. So something like 75% of new companies who have initial good, um, good results and then start having poor results, something like 75% of those companies start fudging their results and actually putting fraudulent um, accounts in because they haven't really taught themselves how to deal with that failure. So the technique here is really get to know what's going to cause you problems and write those if-then intentions. Um, let me pause slightly and just um, ask if there are any questions around anything we've covered so far. And again, you can see Lindsay's put the link up to some of this research, particularly the if-then intentions. Any questions from people? Okay. So the fifth one is again, I think, counterintuitive. So the research here is all around doing something that's called surf the urge. And again, similar to the last thing, this is about getting really comfortable with your discomfort. So really understanding what your cravings are. And what they had people do here is people who were either trying to not stop eating sweets or to stop smoking, they got them to spend a long time with the thing that they most wanted, so either with their cigarette or their, um, in this case, Hershey's cookies. And what they asked those people to do is to get really, really familiar with what the urge felt like to have that cigarette or to have that cookie. Um, and to really be mindful, if you like, to really notice particularly what the physical cravings were. And the more that people were able to do this, the more they found it decoupled the cue and the routine. So some of you who've been on these uh, webinars before will have heard us talk about the habit routine, which, me, which says when we have a cue, it tells us to take an action. 
um, which then gives us a sense of reward. So in this case, the cue between smoking and relaxation was decoupled by just noticing the feeling, staying with it for a period of time, and then believing that it would actually dissipate. Um, and that seems to be what the research is telling us, is if we can stick with that urge rather than take action on it, the urge dissipates, and then we no longer want the thing that, um, that's causing us the, the problem. Now, I guess the only thing I would say about this is avoid having whatever the thing is that's your urge in front of you. So although the experimentation made people walk around with their cigarettes or their Hershey's cookies, um, you know, buying loads of sweets and chocolates and having them in your fridge is probably, um, as Elliot Burtman says, um, something that, you know, adds a level of um, stress to our urges that, that we don't, you know, we don't want to add to the, our willpower problems. So avoiding having things in the house is one way of doing it, but when you get the urge, just sitting with it for a time uh, seems to work really well. And I love the expression, serve the urge. So those are our five techniques. So let's just run through what those are again. So the first is understand the physiology of willpower. Make sure you have good sleep, a diet that avoids having highs and lows of sugar, and that's um, either a vegetarian diet or at least one that's not got loads of junk food in, um, that you take exercise and meditation. Those are all things that, whilst they require willpower, generalize across other willpower challenges. Be compassionate with yourself. If you mess up, um, give yourself a break. Tell yourself you're going to be much more successful in the future, and it's not everything you are. Know yourself in the future. Really get to know the person you are in the future, particularly if your goals are about uh, something long-term that you want to achieve. Um, and then get familiar with the discomfort of the urge that you have. And finally, plan for problems. Write down what it is that might get in the way of you achieving your long-term goals. Write down what those if-then intentions are. So the things that people might offer you, the um, challenges that might come along, and what you're going to do instead of succumbing to them. So that's what I had to say about our willpower urges. Uh, please let me know if you've got any questions about what we've talked about, um, or there are any comments that you have about which, which ones you think might work for you, or which ones you think you're going to find the, big, the most difficult to do in the last sort of three or four minutes that we've got. Um, any challenges that you think you're going <coughs> to, or which ones do you think are going to be most useful to you to deal with your challenges this holiday? And if we think about that one about surfing the urge, I think the steps are to really notice what's going on in your body and what that urge feels like, to breathe and broaden your attention, and then to look for the next opportunity to carry out your goals, because you'll be actually um, knowing what that discomfort feels like. Okay, so some people saying, thank you, Alka, knowing yourself in the future is a good one. Yeah, I think when you think about it, how little we think Spend, personally, I find spend little time thinking about that, so that could be a good one. Someone else really likes um, the self-compassion one. I agree, that's quite a good one, and one that we're probably not that good at. I think the other thing that happens is once you've um, done something that you know doesn't meet your goals, you tend to give up on the whole goal rather than say this is just one lap. 
Well, that's a good one, Keith. Finding someone with the same issues who will support you and help you through the challenges. Yeah, that can be really helpful. There's, um, in goals research, there's quite a lot of evidence that sharing your goals and um, doing them with other people uh, can help you be more likely to, um, to achieve them. And then Claire's saying, match my strategy for having had an alcohol-free November to my Christmas challenge. Oh, very good. Yeah, so knowing what's worked for you, not just the things that get in the way, but also the things that make you strong. Getting familiar with the discomfort is uh, Angela's one, and getting help from those around you. And Lindsay's just posted here another video that's on our website, which is about gremlins, which are those bits of ourselves that tend to trip us up which were probably there for a good reason at one time, um, but uh, trip us up. So that's another way of getting to know yourself. And also a video by um, someone else on um, getting to know yourself. So it seems like the ones that not many people are um, thinking are going to be helpful is more sleep, meditation, exercise, and diet maybe because that feels like a willpower challenge in itself. Um, yeah, an interesting observation here that self-compassion can be a gremlin as well, tripping us up when we're trying to be strong. Yeah. Although the research would say, actually, that in the balance of things, being compassionate with yourself is more likely to work than beating yourself up. Particularly if you combine it um, with some of these other techniques. And there's Lindsay's provocative question, or is that just your gremlin? <laughs> okay. So thank you, everyone. I hope that was useful. I'd be really interested to hear which of these techniques you um, use and which ones really you find help you the most over the Christmas period or over the holiday period. Um, so, you know, we're on Twitter at Head Heart Brain. So tweet us which ones you find most useful uh, and um, how you get on over the, over the holiday period. Are you going to continue the chat in the LinkedIn group, Jan? Cause yeah, oh, thank you for the been, reminder. So I'm just um, going to put the group, that's, there's the group... Um, yeah, so that's a great reminder from Liz. We have a LinkedIn group called Brain Savvy Leaders. And if people want to continue to tell us what's working, what isn't working for them, how they got on, um, that would be fantastic. We can continue the conversation on the group. And also, if you find that you've got any other techniques that you've come across that really work for you, let's share them there on the group. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I know it's a little early, but happy holidays. And um, look forward to um, covering off the next webinar in the new year, which will be on energy, which is probably something we all need for January. I'm going to put thank the link you, up Liz. there for that as well. Thank you. And thank you, Jan. Absolutely brilliant. Some really good, useful self-help there, I think, for, for myself, definitely. I hope everybody else did, got, got something out of that as well. So thank you. Please continue that conversation in the group. I will be sending round the recording through to everybody that's attended. And don't forget about your Christmas present. If you would like to have a chat or find out more about how our free recruitment audit um, might help your business, then please get in touch today um, or this week or before Christmas. Um, and that's at liz.wilson at shorebird-rpo, which I've just put up there. The next event, as John said, is Energy and Organisations. And that's on the 12th of January, so I hope to see you all there. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Um, and thank you, Jan. So um, I shall end the webinar in another minute or so. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And remember, uh, what we put off till tomorrow, we tend not to do. So if you've got <laughs> something you want to achieve, start today. <laughs> well, fabulous. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Final note. Thank you very much, Jan. Bye. Bye.